and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Ila Feet from uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, she's going to talk to us about decoding and modeling the brain's navigational circuits. Thank you very much, Ila. Please. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matteo, and thank you to the organizers for what's been a really stimulating and fun meeting. It's an uh, unusual um, venue to have uh, uh, so much uh, interest between um, machine learning and uh, neuroscience. It's just you know really a very nice mix and friction in the room. So I'm very happy to be here. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, a couple of problems that we've been working on recently. And um, uh, it's very opportune that I get to speak right after Matt and also before uh, David. So uh, I hope that I can you know, touch a little bit on some of the things that Matt said and also maybe on some of the thing th things that David's going to be telling you about. So um, I want to talk about two challenges uh, that we've been grappling with um, that are also common in general to the field of neuroscience. So one is the question of unsupervised discovery of, uh, of latent variables that are encoded in the brain. Okay, and uh, so this is unsupervised discovery by us as scientists of what the brain is encoding and trying to understand the real-time dynamics of these latent variables. Okay, the second part is the discovery of latent variables about the, in the world by the brain and how the brain then manipulates those latent variables in real time to perform the computations that it needs to perform, right? So there's sort of two sorts of these, these things that are related um, and um, I want to spend about half my time talking about each. Okay, so the question of um, unsupervised decoding or the unsupervised extraction uh, of latent variables uh, by us as scientists um, you know, is a question I think that's relevant for the following reasons. So, you know, often um, there, it's unknown what variable is being coded in a particular brain area, but um, it's getting more and more common that we have uh, recordings from, uh, from uh, many neurons in one circuit or many different brain circuits, um, and we get those uh, recordings, uh, you know, uh, over time. It looks like some kind of spike raster of a population of neurons, and uh, the goal is to try to understand what these neurons are encoding, okay? And the problem is that often, uh, you know, even one doesn't know, you know, there may be st sensory stimuli which are under partial control, but often not under full control. In addition, they're internal brain states, and those are certainly not under our full control. And uh, we may not also know what they are, right? So the question is, you know, what can we say about what's encoded here, given that we have at best partial or no control over some of the variables that are driving the responses, okay? And so, you know, I'd argue that this is often the case um, in cognitive areas, okay? But it's also the case often in sensory areas, right? A sensory area, you know, you, that you know um, is encoding some things may also be encoding some other things or, you know, you're not controlling for those things. And it's also true that it, even in circuits where you know what's going on during waking, um, in a different brain state like sleep, uh, you know, you, you don't anymore know what the area is coding, okay? So, so I would argue that there are many situations where we don't know what's being encoded, and so the question is, what can we learn um, about what it, what, 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 what's going on? Okay, so the usual approach to understand um, uh, coding in the brain is that we know we're controlling independent variable, and then we characterize the responses of neurons by regressing uh, their responses onto these, this known independent variable, and usually construct things like tuning curves or pairwise correlations, et cetera, right? So, so something like a single neuron type response uh, you know, to that independent variable or pairwise um, kinds of properties. Okay, and often then we assume that the same characterization applies in different behavioral states like sleep, and then we go on to apply the same decoder in these different states under the assumption that the, 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 the encoding model is the same. Okay, so, so that's sort of the current approach, and by contrast, uh, you know, uh, let's consider the case, as I already said, that the independent variable is unknown, um, and now instead of characterizing the response of neurons one at a time, or, you know, pairwise, the idea is, you know, let's look at the whole population response of uh, the neurons. Let's look at all of them responding together. And even though that response is this high dimensional uh, response, right? It's, you know, if there are n neurons, it's a high dimensional, the instantaneous snapshot of activity is a point in this high dimensional space. Um, you know, something about the structure of the full response, if the circuit is encoding some low dimensional variable, then the idea is that the states uh, or the responses of that full population should also trace out a manifold or you know, uh, you know, some uh, curve or you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, some plane or other dimensional um, uh, you know, manifold in space that, that actually has a matching structure and topology 
as the coded variable, right? So that's sort of the assumption, and you know, um, you know, a lot of theoretical work in trying to understand what neural circuits do proceeds from that from that assumption, right? That uh, neurons encode information as circuits, right, as populations. And it's only recently that we've had the experimental data with which to then bring these ideas that have been proposed in the literature to fruition. And I should mention there's also some beautiful characterization already of you know, experimental um, data from this perspective by you know, various people um, in olfaction and in motor control. And so many of you will recognize most of the names over here. Okay, and, and the works, that's corresponding works. Okay, so the idea is let's, um, let's now, instead of assuming the same characterization applies in different behavioral states, we'll examine the manifold structure of the data, extract um, information from the manifold structure and basically parameterize the manifold, and then um, do the same thing across different states without assume, assuming that the um, coding is preserved. Okay, so, so this approach allows to do some unsupervised discovery of, um, of uh, coded information um, in brain states, and there's no need for any trial structure or averaging um, across time. Okay, so, so here's, you know, what we do is we apply uh, this, this uh, concept of this manifold-based decoding to data from cells in the, in the head direction circuit. Okay, so these are cells from the thalamic area ADN, and uh, what, what, we're, what I'm showing you here is, you know, we can take these data points and plot them as uh, points in this high-dimensional space, and they form some cloud, Okay, and what you can see here, um, oh, and then we can do some characterization in this, in this high dimensional space of the topological characteristics of the data. So we can characterize various properties about whether the data has um, uh, you know, any ring structure to it, or is it a torus, or is it a you know, flat plane or a sheet? And so we can characterize it, so there's some signatures of these different um, topological properties of the data, and in this case, in particular, um, the data has a ring structure, there's, there's, there's a, there's a persistent homology uh, of course, you know, for this you know, Betty 1 number, which tells you about whether or not there's a significant ring in the, in the structure. And so you know, these long lines in this so-called Betty barcode signal that there is a prominent ring in the data that persists you know, over many scales. Okay, so, and I can talk about details of the approach um, after, after the talk and break. Uh, so anyway, so we can, we can characterize the you know, properties of this uh, data cloud, but moreover, because this particular data set is very low dimensional, we can just embed it in a low dimensional space and, uh, and, and just visualize the manifold directly. Okay, so now it turns out that this data is actually, uh, even though it's very low dimensional, it's very convoluted. So there isn't a low dimensional linear subspace that contains the data. So linear methods like PCA and global embedding Linear global embedding methods don't do a great job, but nonlinear global method, uh, embedding methods, as you can see, do a beautiful job. You can see this beautiful ring structure. Okay, and note that, however, you know, having just the embedding is not enough. If I want to now extract what is the encoded variable, you can see very clearly by eye that it's really this one-dimensional periodic variable, a circular variable, rather than two-dimensional coordinates. So even though I've embedded in three-dimensional space, I could embed in 2D. Nevertheless, we know that the real um, uh, variable is a one-dimensional line, and so we can fit a one-dimensional curve to this manifold and now parameterize this line, okay? And by parameterizing it, now we've got a one-dimensional variable that it looks like this data encoding, and uh, we can read off values of this variable and therefore extract an, an estimate of this angular, um, this angular code. Okay, so, um, so what, I, uh, what we can look at then is now we can color the points according to this uh, parameterization. And uh, so this is our unsupervised latent variable estimate. So at each moment in time, this is the value of the angular variable, for example, here, that's being encoded by that state at that moment in time. And now what I'm showing you here is I'm showing you um, the same manifold, the same data points, now colored by the actual head direction of, a, of an animal that's running around, a mouse that's running around in an enclosure, okay, so the same data set just coded by the measured head direction, and you can see these colors match very well indeed. Of course, there's an arbitrary origin and an arbitrary direction, but you know, so once we match those, you can see the match is very good. It's not, it's not exactly the same. You can see some points in the interior that are mislabeled. Okay, according to the head direction. So, well, we can look at more quantitatively. You can, you can see that this manifold decoding method, this completely unsupervised method, uh, gives rise to um, you know, a decoded estimate for angle in blue, and the, the actual measured head direction uh, is in black over here. And so um, you can see that those two things track each other extremely well. Um, it's not just that now that the latent variable tracks the measured head direction uh, that, that you see here, but it turns out that actually the measured latent variable, okay, alpha, this extracted uh, variable, is actually a closer estimate 
so uh, it's closer to an estimate of the internal states of you know, what the animal is thinking of as its own head direction. Okay, so uh, theta hat is the estimate of a supervised decoder that's trained on um, um, known head direction and the neural states. Okay, so really this is like our best estimate that we have in the supervised model of the internal states of the animal, right? So because it's a cognitive system and there's no stimulus called head direction, right? This is a construct. The animal must compute its sense of head direction from a lot of different cues in the world and estimate it over time, right? So there's no reason why the internal estimates should perfectly match the external measured head direction. So this is the best estimate of the internal states of the animal um, uh, uh, and this is our latent variable decoder and you can see it's extremely close and in fact it's closer uh, than the measured um, head direction of the animal. Okay, and moreover, the unsupervised estimate explains more of the spike variance in the data than does the measured head direction. Okay, so it really is measuring internal states rather than just measuring um, the, uh, the, the measured head direction. Okay, in addition, one can then now use this extracted um, latent variable and then get in a fully unsupervised way the tuning curves of, of, of individual neurons. So you can see that. So in um, blue are the unsupervised estimates of tuning curves and in black are the tuning curves obtained by the standard supervised methods of regressing onto a known, the measured head direction variable. Okay, so now um, I promised that we can do something, you know, in other situations, like for example, across behavioral states. So this is during um, REM sleep. And um, in blue is the same uh, uh, data from waking in the animals, these dots, the blue dots. And now the green dots are actually the states of this network um, during REM sleep. And you can see that the states during REM sleep without assumption, you can just see directly that the, that the REM sleep states seem to fall right on top of the waking manifold. Okay, so now we can see directly that during REM, the, the, the circuit really preserves its state. And once again, we can colorize the REM state by some angular variable alpha over here. Okay, so, so because um, this, is, this is still very much a ring, we can do this with topological methods as well, rather than just by visualization. Okay, so now what can we do with that? So now we can analyze, we can try to analyze um, the dynamics. So this is just saying that the states are preserved. What's happening during REM sleep? Okay. So we know that in the, in the spatial navigation circuit in general, there's a lot of interesting dynamics that happens during REM sleep. Interestingly, the head direction circuit has been a bit, um, uh, you know, it hasn't shown some of the uh, behavior like replays and other things that are seen in hippocampus um, during, um, during um, REM and non-REM sleep. Okay, so I wanna just, we wanted to characterize what's going on. So we look at first uh, the dynamics in REM sleep. So um, once again, green is REM and blue is waking. So during waking, we can look at trajectories on the manifold and you can see that during waking, so these are trajectories of about a second long, uh, one second long, and so in waking, you can see the trajectories tend to just be unidirectional, consistent with the animal sort of making coherent movements with its head as, it, as it's you know, navigating a space. By contrast, during REM, you can see that the trajectories are more compact and they sort of double back on each other um, and so on. So we can do some quantification of these trajectories and try to ask what is the dynamics during REM sleep. And so by using various measures, including you know, seeing that, okay, so during waking, um, the um, changes in angle are, are correlated, the blue curve, whereas during REM sleep, the changes in angle are more uncorrelated. Okay, so um, the updates are more uncorrelated. This is just like you can anecdotally see in these trajectories, there's much more changing of direction, doubling back. Um, but nevertheless, the updates are local. Okay, so there's small changes in angle and they're all very local. And so if we plot the square deviation angle per unit, you know, as a function of elapsed time um, interval, then what we find is, so during waking, uh, let's just look here during waking, um, the, the curve for squared change in angle versus um, elapsed time is quadratic during waking because movements are cohesive. So in a unit time, if there's you know, a fixed speed with which you move, you move some delta angle, and then uh, your square deviation in a small amount of time is gonna be you know, scale like the square of time, right? So that's why this is you know, a quadratic curve, so this is very non-diffusive movement, it's coherent movement. And so this is blue, so this is the waking curve. And that's the same curve is plotted again here in blue. But if you look at the um, REM data, it looks like the animal is really, the, the head direction estimate, this internal estimate um, in the circuit is really linear, okay? And this linear, this linear um, growth in square, uh, square change in angle versus time is uh, together with you know, local updates that are uncorrelated uh, is characteristic of a diffusion process. So it's really just a random walk on the manifold, okay? And, um, 
So we know that it, it looks diffusive and we can characterize some other things about it to show that it's really diffusive and a homogeneous diffusion, which I think, for, so I think there are two things to say at this point. So the one thing is that um, in the previous slide, uh, just seeing that there's this beautiful ring in the, in the states, right? We know that, you know, head direction is the circular variable, but to really see that the states of the circuit lie in a ring um, is really, I think, first of all, a, a, a real, you know, it's just a, it, it's a direct visualization of something that's long been hypothesized as a model of the head direction circuit, you know, these continuous attractor network models, the ring models that were proposed by Ketchen Shang and, um, um, and uh, Hans Polinsky and collaborators in another context for visual orientation uh, tuning. Uh, you know, it's, it's a vindication sort of of those ideas and um, it's like a mammalian analog of what was seen recently in the last couple of years in the in insect head direction circuit where there was actually a physical layout of the ring um, in the brain. Okay, so now we can visualize a similar ring in the mammalian circuit. Now, okay, so the second thing that these models predict, these continuous attractor models, they predict that in the absence of a, you know, a, a cohesive head direction velocity input, the state uh, should diffuse uh, along the ring, okay? So if it's really a manifold that's sort of neutrally stable along all angular representations, you should expect to see diffusive dynamics, and that's what we see here. But the second thing that's interesting about seeing this diffusion, diffusive dynamics is we can characterize the rate of diffusion, okay? And uh, by just reading off the, the slope of this curve. And we can also theoretically, um, there are theoretical predictions about what you expect for the rate of diffusion in the circuit, given the number of neurons in the system and given um, the peak firing rates of the neurons. Okay, and what's very interesting is that if you expect that the neurons, uh, so the question is, what is the mechanism of this diffusion? So if diffusion happens by just uh, because of random activity in the individual neurons in the circuit, then you would expect uh, diffusion to actually be for this number of neurons and these peak firing rates. The, the, the theory predicts that diffusivity should be down here, okay, this dash curve. And you can see that the diffusivity is actually up here. In fact, it's a 10 to 40 times discrepancy in the diffusivity uh, relative to what you would predict from independent neural noise alone, okay? So within the circuit. And so then the question is, what is the amount of noise and what kind of noise do you need in order to get this large magnitude of diffusivity? And so what we find by, um, you know, through the theory and then implementing um, um, numerics, uh, numerical models of it, we find that if we have uh, noisy inputs in the form of the velocity signal that comes in to move the activity along the ring, okay? And we put in a noise uh, with a magnitude that's consistent with the magnitude of velocity inputs that would be needed to move the bump around to respond to head direction velocity inputs during waking, inputs of the same order of magnitude are then exactly sufficient to produce these kinds of diffusive, um, slow, th this, this rate of diffusivity you know, along the ring. So that strongly suggests that this kind of cognitive or memory circuit for head direction, okay, is limited not by internal noise within the system, but by, um, sense, you know, by, by sort of, uh, sensory noise or noise about the estimate of velocity coming in. Uh, and so, I mean, I think this has been a long-standing question and theme and various, you know, for each, you know, for sensory circuits, you know, is it sort of, is the noise or the, you know, the main limitation and sort of perception because of the sensors or is it because of the recurrent processing in these circuits? And I would say that at least in this head direction circuit, we can say um, building on work that, you know, uh, of many people, um, uh, in, in sensory biophysics and in, you know, um, the, bi you know, um, uh, uh, quantitative measures of fluctuations in the visual system and, and so on, that in the head direction circuit, it looks like the limiting factor is not the internal noise, but it's really the externally driven um, fluctuations. Okay, and so um, uh, let's talk about now non-REM sleep. Okay, so what, what do these states look like during non-REM sleep and what's going on? So during non-REM sleep, it turns out that the manifold is no longer ring-like. So blue is again waking. Now orange, uh, this uh, mustard is um, the states during non-REM sleep. And you can see that the circuit now has lost uh, the ring topology. And once again, we can quantify it using the topological measures. Mm, and, uh, and so uh, it's, it's uh, you know, whatever was keeping the states confined to the ring is not doing that anymore, okay? And so um, we, can, we can decode, so we can um, assign on this manifold, we can assign a circular variable, and we can assign, or like a tangential variable, and we can assign a second variable, which is like a radial uh, variable, which is distance from the centroid of the manifold. 
Okay, and then when we decode both of, both of these things, um, so we get this angular decoding um, in mustard, and then we get this radial decoding again in mustard, and it turns out that the angular decoding uh, is, is actually very consistent with uh, a decoding for an angle that you would get by using a tuning curve decoder, uh, you know, obtained from the waking dynamics, okay? So there is really still a sense in which um, the system is encoding some angular variable, but it's also encoding this other radial variable, and what is that? It turns out that this radial variable really corresponds to fluctuations in the amplitude of the neural response, okay? So, so there's an amplitude fluctuation in addition to these, you know, angular modulations. Okay, so the other thing is that by looking at this manifold, so if you only looked at, the, at this manifold and then applied a tuning curve decoder to it where you assume that the only variable being decoded was angle, uh, being encoded was angle, so you basically, you decoded the states by projecting them onto this angular ring and then studied dynamics on it. Okay, so let's look at the dynamics. So here are different trajectories that are one second, and I think even by eye you can see that these trajectories cover a lot more space. Okay, so there are these big sweeps, but there are also some local confined trajectories, so sweeps and confined trajectories. Okay, so what we are finding here, so if, if we projected these trajectories onto just the angle dimension, then it turns out that the dynamics still look diffusive, but, but just strongly diffusive. Instead, we can see that there's actually two different types of dynamics, these coherent sweeps and then these localized um, um, uh, these localized trajectories. So if we only decode along the angle, then it looks like if you look at the autocorrelation of the angular states, the, the system decorrelates very rapidly. You should look at the mustard curve. You can see that the autocorrelations are really, really short-lived. But on the other hand, if we do the correlations on the full manifold, this two-dimensional uh, structure now, now you can see that actually uh, the correlations are quite long-lived. In fact, they're longer-lived than during waking. So they go from being very short-lived if you assume that the only, the manifold is one-dimensional, to actually being longer-lived th uh, than waking when you decode on the full manifold. Okay, and in fact, um, uh, these sweeps uh, happen in time during sweep, uh, sleep spindles. So Terry talked a bit about sleep spindles, and sleep spindles in thalamus have a higher co-occurrence, have are correlated with uh, the, the existence of sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus. So there may be some connection between um, uh, you know, sharp wave ripples in hippocampus and spindles in thalamus, and these sweeps, these smooth events, happen during these spindle events. Okay, so it is a bit suggestive of possibly there's some replay-related activity, but I think more remains to be seen. Okay, so let me just summarize this part to say that, you know, here we can have a direct visualization of the low-dimensional state space ring in the mammalian head direction circuit. I think it's really gratifying, and it's consistent with decades of theory. We have a proof of concept of accurate unsupervised decoding of internal cognitive states um, in the circuit. Um, we can understand cortical dynamics, uh, circuit dynamics during non-waking states um, without assuming that they equal the wake states. And we can get a quantitative and not just a qualitative understanding of REM diffusion. Um, and this helps us to understand something about the likely origins of this dynamics during sleep. And um, maybe also because it's a quantitative uh, model, one could try to ask maybe how this diffusivity uh, varies across individuals um, in disease states uh, versus non-disease states, right? It's a quantitative measure mm, of like memory and you know, stability of the circuit. Okay, and finally, um, you know, the question is, we didn't exploit any of the temporal information in the data to construct a manifold method, and I think David's gonna tell you about a method uh, from his group in the next talk uh, that beautifully exploits also the temporal structure to extract information from manifolds. Okay, so um, I'm going to then next talk about a little bit um, some uh, work on understanding how circuits in the brain do spatial reasoning. So, um, all right, so I wanna start with the premise that a lot of the behaviors, spatial behaviors that animals do, are very rich. Okay, this is a three-dimensional maze of a kangaroo rat, you know, so it's dark, there are all these branching points, there's a bunch of entrances and exits marked by Z, and this animal has to navigate this maze to get in and get out, and presumably has a good model of where it is, and, um, you know, where it must, you know, go, et cetera. Okay, so now, you know, how do animals do all of these, you know, rich behaviors? They, you know, enter new rooms, they build maps of new spaces, uh, and then they can infer their location within these spaces. They can plan trajectories, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, on the, so there, that's the behavior side. And then on the neural side, we've got a bunch of neural substrates, right? On some level, the, the circuits for spatial navigation are some of the best characterized of the cognitive circuits that we know about, right? Some of the best cognitive 
uh, characterizations are in the spatial domain. Um, but I would argue that even though we know a lot about you know, the existence of head direction cells, grid cells, boundary cells, landmark cells, place cells, and all these different areas, um, our characterizations, um, you know, many of them are sort of carried out you know, in, in terms of describing things like tuning curves, and tuning curves provide really a quasi-static view of activity, right? You've got to, like really, you know, the animal has to you know, have a stationary response to some environment, and then you just average over time, right? It's kind of not an unfolding of a computation over time that we're measuring when we measure tuning curves. Okay, so what remains unknown is the temporal dynamical evolution of states and the interaction of neurons as the computation unfolds you know, during spatial reasoning. So to try to understand a little bit uh, more from a theoretical perspective, you know, what must go into? So the question is, one question is, you know, animals solve you know, pretty sophisticated spatial tasks. Um, to what extent is the phenomenology that we've observed already in hippocampus consistent with being able to solve those tasks? Like, can we give a functional interpretation to some of the things that we've already seen? And also, can we try to ask about what more we should expect to see, you know, when animals solve these, solve, solve these kinds of tasks? So to try to answer these questions, um, Ingmar, Ken Scheider from my group, um, set up uh, a few different spatial problems uh, that were, you know, you know, sufficiently simple, but yet sufficiently challenging to evoke, um, to require interesting um, uh, responses and, uh, and, and, and you know, we're kind of non-trivial in some sense. So this is a one-dimensional navigation task where the, the task is that um, the, uh, uh, you know, the agent's put into a ring with uh, multiple perceptually identical landmarks, okay, discrete landmarks, and they look the same, and they're un indistinguishable. And the agent's placed at a random location, and its, its job is to like, run around and then uh, decode where, it, you know, figure out where it is. Okay, and in, there are two settings. There's one setting in which, let's just, and I'll only talk about the setting um, today, but there's a setting in which the animal is provided with a map, okay, and it's told where the landmarks are, absolute coordinates, but it doesn't know, you know, it's not, that's, that's it, right? It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't get told which landmark it's at. So in this case, it gets a noisy velocity input, which is a noisy version, corrupted version of its actual velocity, and then every time it hits one of the landmarks, it gets this full map of the environment telling it where the two landmarks are, or the three landmarks are, et cetera. And the network is trained on environments with you know, variable numbers of, of these landmarks um, and at very varying locations. And each time it hits a landmark, it's provided with a map for that particular environment, and it's trained over many environments. Okay? And so um, it's a recurrent network with, uh, with a readout where we ask it to just, the animal has to report um, location uh, at every, every time. Okay? And the second task is uh, to um, localize and also identify, classify, you know, a bunch of different environments. So these are all random polygons, and the task is for the animal to, you know, go in, interact with the walls, and there's no long distance vision in either of these tasks, so the animal has to actually physically, these are all, um, you know, has to physically go encounter or hit the wall before it gets information about the angle at with, it, with, with, the with which it hit the wall, and that's the only information it receives. Okay, and so, um, so, so that's uh, this two-dimensional task, and then once again, we train a recurrent network, uh, with the velocity input and this border angle information. And then here the goal is just to, uh, for the network to identify which environment the, it's in and also then location within the environment. And because when we train these, when we train these networks, um, it, actually the networks do really well. So um, these are you know, particle filters that have been provided with the same map and the network matches that performance. Path integration really doesn't work um, in, this, in this task. Um, the networks, you know, train on 100 random environments and ask to classify them, um, do very well. So here's the network, and in black is an oracular particle filter that's being told actually what the environment is. It doesn't have to do that part of the task. It knows the environment. All it has to do is localize within it. Um, that's, so that's our benchmark over here. And then the classification performance is really good, and you can see that actually this is a problem of simultaneous localization mapping because um, the animal has to identify which environment it's in before it can localize within it. But you know, to localize within it, it needs to get information from the walls and figure out which, you know, where it is. So, so it's only when the, the localization error really drops suddenly when it has classified the environment. So it's really this, you know, this, these two streams of computation. And um, actually, this um, network is very efficient at it. You know, so a particle filter with like 10,000 particles um, uh, does about as well as the network with about 256 LSTM units. Okay, so um, just to uh, very quickly tell you what's um, um, uh, what, what these networks can do. These networks can do um, really well. So it turns out that you know, if, if, if you give it a, a task with uh, two landmarks, so post-training, again, there's no learning once it's trained. The test environments are, you know, you draw a new environment from your, from your distribution, run the system, and there's no learning at that point. 
okay, learning is turned off, and now this is a trial after learning is turned off, and this is an easy trial, and this is a difficult trial, and a difficult trial, the landmarks are nearly 180 apart, and then it's very difficult to tell the difference because the velocity is also noisy, and these two intervals look very similar. This is easy because if you go the short distance versus the long distance, it's very distinguishable, and so you can see that actually, you know, early in time in the easy trial, um, the network kind of has, you know, maybe two possible positions where it thinks it is, and then over time, it actually collapses and then represents only one position, and it's the correct one. In this difficult trial, even though there's just two landmarks, you can see that for many, for a long period, like three landmark encounters, it maintains uh, the estimate of two possible locations and then collapses to one, right? So it's kind of doing this probabilistic representation. It's representing simultaneously the two possibilities over where it is, and um, the amount of time it takes to do this grows uh, to collapse, it's, uh, you know, it's uncertainty, grows with task difficulty, so it's sort of automatically adjusting, sort of holding off and making a commitment. It's saying, you know, this task is harder, I'm just gonna, you know, keep two possibilities alive, and then I'm gonna collapse them when I'm pretty sure, right? It's sort of like doing this, and it's doing this dynamically in real time. Like, we don't, we don't, we don't tell it when it should wait to collapse the, uh, the, the, um, the decision. In fact, what's really interesting is that actually it doesn't even need to encounter um, a landmark, you know, it can just sort of uh, already collapse, you know, after one landmark encounter. If it starts at a landmark and then goes long enough, then it knows that, okay, it was at this, if it's going counterclockwise and it goes for a long enough time before encountering another landmark, already before it hits the second landmark, it knows where it is. So in fact, it's able to infer something about its location and, and collapse its distribution, probably distribution, without an explicit input. So it, you know, I mean, I think that's really cool. I think that's pretty cool. Like, it doesn't actually need a discrete piece of evidence to say, aha, I now know something. It just collapses at that point. Okay, I want to show you a quick video here. I think I'm basically out of time. I want to show you a video, and I wanted to do some more um, neural characterization, but I'm going to have to skip the slide, but I want to just get through this video. Um, so you can see this is the two-dimensional task. Okay, so the true trajectory is in black, so that's where the animal really is. Um, the path integration strategy is in pink, and you'll see how horrible that is. It gets out of the box. And then there's a particle filter, um, which is um, in, in blue, okay? And um, in fact, oh, so the network, and I, you know, the network isn't, yeah, I should have, sorry, I put the wrong video on here. The network actually follows very closely the particle filter. And what you'll see at the beginning of the video is that um, the, uh, okay, what you'll see here is that, you know, early, early in time, so this is the classification problem, it, the pink outlines show that you know, all of these environment identifications are possible, but after a few wall encounters, you know, the, the agent starts to figure out where it is um, and so on, and then collapses to a single, to a single environment. And I'll say that, you know, just touching on something that Matt said, um, actually this two-dimensional task can be trained on, um, it can be trained on entirely novel um, environments, polygons, one after another. And then at the end, we can turn off learning and now give it 10 new environments, okay, entirely new ones, and ask it to do both localization and classification with this, those environments and only train the readout weights without retraining the recurrent weights, and it can actually solve that task. So somehow the network is able to you know, solve this problem um, even without learning um, of these new environments except for learning the feedforward weights. So somehow the recurrence dynamics in real time, it's really very different from a hub field network or something else. In real time, it's sort of being able to you know, do the calculation of both localization and classification in this environment. Okay, so let me just um, just go to my um, acknowledgement slide. So and then and then I'll just stop there for questions and answers. So so the summary is basically you know there are efficient solutions. <laughs> <laughs> there are efficient solutions. Um, there's some neural stuff that I didn't tell you about. We were looking under the hood. I just didn't get a chance. But thanks very much for the attention. And this work was done by um, many people in my group um, in Austin as well as collaborators in Princeton. Um, and McGill, and uh, this work on navigation by neural networks was done by Ingmar. Thank you. So we have uh, Terry, and we have a question there. Have you asked a question before? Good, you're first. Um, then we have one there, maybe one, two, three. Thanks. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, Thank so you. I have my question is about the first part where you were talking about uh, discovering latent variables. So it seems like um, the head position was accounting for a lot of variance. I can imagine that some of the latent variables are maybe more difficult to interpret. So I wonder if you have a systematic way of figuring out what the latent variable actually uh, corresponds to. Um, 
Yeah, so, so, so that's, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think, so in this case, well, there are two ways to take your question, right? One question is, uh, one way to take it is that in this case, the manifold was very low dimensional, right? And we could see by eye directly that there's nothing else encoded, right? It was really this one dimensional ring, and we can characterize the topology and tells us it's a ring, we can embed it and look at it, and we know it's a ring. Um, uh, one way to, you know, say, uh, one way to push me is to say, well, what if, you know, the, the, the ring had some thickness? Uh, could it be that there's another variable like hidden in there that's being encoded? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, that could be, uh, but, you know, there's, uh, so, so in these methods, so in this method, um, as you get more signal to noise ratio, which you do by getting more neurons, so if the manifold dimension stays fixed, but you get more and more neurons, the signal to noise ratio with which you reconstruct the structure, it improves. Okay, and so you know th there is a fuzziness to the cloud that um, that is you know inher you know inherently there because of noise, and so I would say that you know up to the fuzziness of the noise or the SNR in the data, we couldn't tell if there was any other variable, uh, but maybe there is still some structure even given the fuzziness of the data. You know, maybe may maybe some of the, the the thickness of the ring is the fuzziness of the data, but maybe there's in addition some other variable. So we could in addition parametrize you know, you know, some other dimensions along that ring, you know, along the, you know, within the thickness of the ring and then explicitly look for some other correlates. Um, it's true we could, you know, we should do that and, 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 and we will. Uh, but I would say that, you know, certainly we can make some statement like up to the width of the ring or up to, you know, the scatter or, you know, up to this amount of variance, there's no other information being coded, right? So there would have to be some kind of statement like that. So we have two minutes and two yeah. questions. I'm not sure it's gonna work, but let's see. Um, there was someone before Terry Yes, do you have a microphone? Mm, it's coming. Hello, uh, I have a related question. Um, so the, the head direction was a, had, a, had a nice uh, ring structure to, to the variable itself. Um, I was wondering to what extent this is generalizable to uh, attractors that don't have ring structures. Um, so, so the, you, you mean the method? So the method is, right, I mean, so given, given a man manifold structure, you parameterize along it, right? So it's, I think the, conceptually it's perfectly generalizable. You could ask about, you know, technically implementing it. It's true that the higher dimensional your splines get, the more complexity for, you know, in the, in the task of doing the parameterization. It's just harder, right? And so, I mean, that's a general problem, right? That is the machine learning problem, is like, you know, parameterizing you know, high dimensional latent variables and, and characterizing them. So yeah, I mean, it does, it gets more complicated, but conceptually there's no reason why you couldn't apply the same analysis to manifolds of, you know, arbitrary dimension, arbitrary topology. You would do all the topological characterization, extract all the topological variables that are non-trivial, and then, you know, along the, you know, extended dimensions, uh, you would, you know, parametrize. And David Tank will tell you about, you know, uh, decoding of, uh, I think, uh, uh, two-dimensional variables. Terry. Yeah, quick. So I missed how many neurons you uh, analyzed in the case of the uh, sleep manifold, and where were they recorded from? Yeah, great question. So um, the, cell, the, 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 the data cloud that I showed you is about 40 neurons, and so it's not a large number, so that's, it's really within reach for a lot of labs. Um, so it's about 40 cells. I only showed you cells recorded from ADN. The, we also have data sets for post subiculum so head direction cells come in, you know, thalamus, and there are also some in a hippocampal formation uh, in the post subiculum And there's an interesting story also about post subiculum Those, uh, the manifold is higher dimensional there, and there's some interesting coding of the behavioral state. So from the, from the post subiculum data, we can explicitly and linearly decode um, the, you know, REM from wake from non-REM, but you can't do that from the ADN data. So there's some, like, sort of explicit coding of state or you know, at least uh, linear separability of state in that data set. Well, all right. Well, thank you very much, Ila. Thanks thank again. You. So um, the next speaker and last speaker of the day um, is David Tank uh, who, uh, from Princeton. Um, he will tell us about neural dynamics during navigation and decision making. This goes up up to 25 minutes, 25 minutes, yeah. And then five. This is this works. <coughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, 
Thank, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and uh, thanks for everybody for sticking around um, so late in the day. So um, in this, uh, in the sort of the spirit of a canonical computation,